From Classical WETA in Washington, we take you behind the music as we get into it all with conversations with local and touring musicians. Go on deep dives to figure out things like, what exactly is a symphony? And in our first episode, how does a composer write music? I'm joined by renowned composer from Washington, Alistair Coleman. He's won several awards, was previously composer-in-residence with the National Philharmonic Orchestra, and he's also the youngest composer ever published by the Shermer Music Company. We talk about composer misconceptions, how differently Mozart and Beethoven wrote music, and his own writing process. Welcome, Alistair. It's great to have you for our first episode on Classical Breakdown. Great to be here. Last time I saw you, you were a freshman, but now you're going into your third year at Juilliard. That's right. So that's pretty exciting. Time's flying, I'm sure. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's been a, a really amazing experience so far, um, just getting into uh, the environment of, of Juilliard in New York. Um, it's just an endless kind of ecosystem of all these different things happening at the same time. So it's it's amazing kind of getting my feet wet. So what are some of the biggest misconceptions that people have about composers? So I'd say I think one of the things that even I thought when I was growing up uh, about composers is uh, like Beethoven and, and Mozart and Bach is they're these, these uh, people that lock themselves in a room, in a dark room all day, probably never see the sun and just write music 24 hours a day. Maybe not even sleep. I don't know. But I've, I've come to discover just getting into the, the process of writing music and meeting other composers, especially contemporary living composers, is that composers are very, very invested in, and very um, integrated into, into the world around them or around us. Uh, a lot of the some of the most compelling music that's being written today is is about our experience, our experience as as a culture and um, as a society. I mean, just think about one of the most iconic pieces of of the of recent decades is the uh, John Adams Nixon in China. It's about uh, I think it's the 1972 uh, visit that President Nixon had in. Uh, in China, and it's it's been a, a groundbreaking work, and it kind of has one foot into the, the the classical musical tradition, but then also has another foot into the what's happening in the world around us, and um, I think that's kind of what makes art so interesting, especially art that's being created right here, right now. Yeah, well, like you said, people thinking you're locked in a room. All, all day, all night, writing feverishly, maybe in the dark. But it's also, I think, a misconception is people think it's just you are born with this and there's this divine inspiration that falls <laughs> into you and the music flows out of you uh, with that. But that's not really quite the case, is it? Not really. I mean, I, I started singing uh, in a choir uh, in D.C., uh, the St. Paul's K Street Men and Boys Choir. And in that experience, I, I was just inundated with choral music, uh, mainly of the, the English choral tradition. So, you know, cathedral music uh, and composers like Howells and, and Stamford and Walton, and I mean, you name it. And from that experience, I started taking piano lessons. And instead of uh, practicing my pieces, which my, my teacher and my parents really wanted me to do, I just started improvising. And just things just began to just develop. I think I just got bored with practicing and just wanted to do my own thing. And that's kind of how I discovered that I wanted to create music more than just not only just play the, the great pieces that have been in the canon, but also just to, to create something new and create something that's kind of me. But I kind of got into composing that way. And, and once I started learning theory and notation, I started writing these improvisations down and they evolved into new pieces with teachers and training and uh, music theory. But there are a lot of composers out there who start in so many different ways. And there are a lot of programs out there, or actually there's one in particular that I'm, I'm a part of. Uh, it's called Music Comp, uh, which is a, a organization in Vermont. And they have, I think, about 50 to 60 students from you know, K through 12 who are, who really have, may have no musical experience at all, or maybe play 10 instruments, uh, but they're writing music using technology that's being developed today to allow uh, people of all ages and all from all backgrounds to, to create something and create something in music. So does that also kind of mean that, well, anyone can write music? Honestly, I, I think so. I think if, 
if you're in the car or doing laundry and you're uh, humming a tune that may not come from anywhere, may just come from uh, something that you're thinking about or something you're hearing in your head, just humming a tune is is kind of creating music. Or if you play an instrument and you play a chord progression that doesn't really come from anywhere and just comes from your instinct and and uh, and your knowledge of different chords and how they function, that's creating music. Uh, if you use GarageBand to loop sounds together, that's composing. So let's jump into two major composers, and it seems like they both had uh, very different approaches. That's Mozart and Beethoven. What's the difference between these two and their process? So both composers are, I mean, you can't get any more famous than Mozart and right. Beethoven. Uh, and their music has transcended time. I mean, the music being played today is, is a lot of it in, in, in orchestra concerts are, are Mozart and Beethoven and, and a lot of other amazing composers. But uh, these two had very, very different uh, approaches to to writing music, but also to, to actually um, notating something on a piece of paper. And you can see it in their manuscripts. Uh, Mozart uh, and a lot of people just from from popular culture like Amadeus and and things like that, Mozart just had this unique genius to him. I mean, even at a very, very young age. And you can see in his manuscripts that he would literally just write note by note, maybe even just like vertically, um, what he was hearing in his head. And he wouldn't go back. He would just keep going and going and going until the piece was completed. And his manuscripts are super clear, and it's kind of incredible from from my perspective to see just the amount of detail and the amount of clarity that is on that autograph manuscript. But then on the flip side, you have Beethoven, um, who, <laughs> in his manuscripts, are they are just kind of a, if I can say, a mess. They're a uh, mess. <laughs> yeah, they're a mess. They have scribbles all over the place. He's crossing things out. He's uh, constantly just changing an idea after idea after idea, re- revision after revision after revision. Uh, I think it's because he he re- he was a perfectionist, like a lot of composers. And one of the things he would do, and this again, you can see this in his manuscripts, uh, he would take a motif or an idea and write out multiple versions of that idea. I mean, 10, 20, 30, 40 different versions. And he would change things ever so slightly with each variation until he found the perfect one, the best one that could work. And, I mean, it, it shows in the music. I mean, his his motifs are iconic, and he takes those simple ideas that he's developed, uh, that he's created, he, he develops it over time throughout the piece, and that's kind of what makes Beethoven Beethoven. Yeah. Well, we're going to have on the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org pictures of these manuscripts because I look at the Beethoven one here. It's mostly scribble <laughs> and there's a couple of notes. It almost looks like it'd, it'd be in a museum of modern art right? As, as, a, as a drawing or something. And also Mozart here, which is just – you could sit down and actually play through this by looking at the music. Beethoven, I mean, good luck. <laughs> playing that without a, a good written out copy of it. But when you're talking about Mozart and writing it down vertically, so if uh, people know, if you have an orchestral work and you have all of the instruments, they're all stacked on top of each other on a piece of paper from piccolo down to bass and percussion, there might be um, 15 different parts there. A lot of composers would actually write a melody line and then a bass line and then go back and fill this stuff in, right? Right. But Mozart was able to, with a lot of stuff, just write up and down, up and down, write the whole thing out um, as if it, it already existed in his head. Absolutely. I mean, you can just you can just see in, in the manuscript just the, the amount of capacity he had in his head for music. And there, there's an anecdote that I, I've... Uh, I learned at, at Juilliard is is uh, Mozart is the reason why we have a written down uh, arrangement or, or a, um, a score for uh, an iconic piece. It's the uh, Allegri Miserere, uh, and it's it's a piece that w- that he actually experienced when he was 14 years old. He uh, heard it in the Sistine Chapel, and at that time there was no written down version of it. That's just not how things went. Um, and he, just by listening to that piece being performed in the chapel, 
uh, he was able to go home and literally write note for note perfectly the the actual score, and that's what we use today. Um, I actually used to sing this piece when I was um, a chorister in the, the DC choir that I sang in. So Beethoven was somebody who would revise, go back and forth, and scratch something out, put something else in. But there's also other composers who have, I mean, just straight up burned music or trashed it because <laughs> they just they didn't want it part of their legacy. You know, there's you know stories of Tchaikovsky and Brahms and Dvorak, also perfectionists, who just if it wasn't perfect, they didn't want it out there. Right. I mean, and there are there are lots of composers uh, throughout history and and even composers today who have. You know, pretty unusual methods, or or maybe not so um, so generic methods of of writing music in terms of what people think about composing. I mean, I I thought this was pretty funny. Stravinsky uh, would, if he got writer's block, or if he just was having trouble uh, composing that day, he would actually do a headstand because um, he he said apparently I think it's a quote. He says. Uh, it rests the head and clears the brain. Um, I can't even do a headstand, no. but um, I can't imagine just just seeing pictures of Stravinsky like doing that kind of acrobatic uh, kind of display. I, I don't know. I, I I thought that was pretty funny. Well, I think that's also interesting when you when you think of writer's block and it sounds terrifying. And if you if you're in it, you'll do anything to get out of it. Stravinsky doing a headstand. Um, some other composers I've heard laying nude on a piano <laughs> out with an open window. You know, there's stories of uh, of that. But one thing that composers and other artists have in common, painters, writers, or um, sculptors, and that is a lot of them went on long walks, extended walks. Tchaikovsky, I think, was um, so adamant that it had to be like two hours. Anything less mm-hmm. was tragic to your health. Uh, Beethoven, Mahler, Benjamin Britten going out for a walk saying that on these walks, he would be able to plan his next steps in his composition and Beethoven jotting down ideas as he you know, strolled through the city. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of a it's a therapeutic thing. I I feel that it's a therapeutic thing just going for a walk and not listening to for me in the in the 20, 21st century, not listening to any music um and just maybe even not bring my phone at all. Um just totally um just detaching from from everything and just experiencing just the outdoors or experiencing something for me, like going in Central Park for a walk every day is 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 what I do. But it, it's it's such an in, an invigorating kind of experience, especially when I'm stuck uh, between sixty sixty fifth and sixty sixth Street uh, in a practice room all day. Um, just going for a walk in Central Park and and experiencing the beauty of of New York and also just people watching. It's kind of it's kind of cool to to experience that, but I have kind of I do think about the thing that, that that whatever piece I'm working on on my walk, and I just think about it. And sometimes, just getting away from the score, or just getting away from Sibelius, or getting away from the piano is uh, just helps you come back to that feeling totally ref- uh, refreshed. Walking is so important in that it's like you're still using your brain. You're walking. You're navigating around, but you're freeing up a lot of space in your head to then kind of process some of these ideas, whether it's writing music or, or literature or whatever. But when you're if you're sitting in a room, you're staring at a wall and that's all you're doing, trying to get the music to come out. It's like you got to distract your mind a little bit um, in the right way, maybe by by walking. And for many, many artists, that is something that works. I think there's something to that. I think there's also something to Kind of what you said, being detached, maybe leaving the phone, maybe putting it on do not disturb while you go for a walk. I've heard a lot of um, people saying that boredom is a huge part of creativity. Without boredom, a lot of ideas don't uh, get developed or maybe come to you in the same way. And and they're saying now with with a lot of us. There is no boredom. You got five seconds. There's Twitter, exactly. Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook. You're doing. You're you're taking up that time as opposed to, you know, either taking in your surroundings. And it's not to make some kind of big soapbox thing about it, but it's the boredom that we're kind of missing out on. That is a big part of also being creative. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I I'm no exception to being uh, 
a prisoner of Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and all that good stuff. All of us. All of us. Uh, but it, it is. I, I, and I, I've become more conscious of this uh, just in the past year or so um, because it, it's getting more and more just in our face all the time. I mean, I, I just do it unconsciously. I just take out my phone. I click on Facebook and there I am. Yeah. You know, it's just yeah. uh, online. But – but I, I do think it's it's things like going for a walk or, or I go for a run um, every day as well. And just not having your face in, in, a, in a screen or, or just trying to experience the world around you or around, around oneself, uh, that can just be a real – I don't know. It's, it's refreshing. I'm, I'm losing the word, but it's – it is refreshing and it can be, you know, even we talking about composers and artists going on walks and being able to free your mind that way. Even Mozart, I believe he was writing, he wrote a lot of a, a certain symphony like in his head while he was in a carriage going from one city to the next, just <laughs> staring out the window and, and looking at, you know, what's passing by as opposed to, I mean, it's a lot of fun, but, you know, watching the new show on Netflix, <laughs> you know, that occupies some of your time that, you know, for, for Mozart would be different, you know, being able to... Be creative in, in your own boredom. So we'll get to your process and how you write music right after this. Let's take a break. Classical Breakdown is made possible by Classical WETA. Join us for the music anytime, day or night. To listen live, just go to our website, classicalweta.org, or download our app. It's free in the App Store. So, Alistair, we've had... Mozart and Beethoven and Mahler and all these different composers and how they write music. What is the process like for you when you're writing music? I'd say it really comes down to how I started with creating music in the first place, which is by improvising. One of the things that I think about all the time is is how can I how can I my process improve or how can I learn something new about myself by changing something up in terms of maybe when I compose or how I compose. But I think it's something that I think just evolves throughout one's life. I mean, composing is something that one keeps learning about over time. I mean, it's it's not like playing an instrument where there's a rush to to get really, really good at a young age, as you probably know. Yes, that's right. Um, it's something that that just evolves over time. And my process has certainly evolved even in the, you know, the short amount of time that I've been composing. Uh, but right now I, I start by improvising. Every single piece I start just at the piano, just kind of noodling around and seeing what happens. I mean, sometimes I just lose complete track of time improvising. I could spend like two hours without noticing that two hours has gone by. Um, that's where things start. And it's something I do every single day. And if I'm working on a specific piece, maybe I'll, I'll definitely have like the instrumentation in my head. I'll have some of the parameters that I, that have been set if it's a commission or if it's some kind of project that I'm working on. But the actual musical content, the ideas come from me sitting at the piano, just seeing what happens. And that can be kind of a frustrating, but also really exciting experience. Cause sometimes I just think, listen, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be listening to what I'm playing or, and I'll just think to myself, you know, what are you thinking? Like, come on, just come up with something already. Um, do you record yourself when I, you're at the piano? I don't. I just merely use my instincts in, in terms of hearing what, what's happening. Um, and what happens, what happens with, with melodies or ideas or motifs that probably end up in my pieces are that they come back in some way. Um, you know, I'll be, I'll improvise on Monday and I'll kind of just go and there will be an idea, but I'll just, you know, completely disregard it. And then on Tuesday or Wednesday, when I improvise again, that thing comes back or it comes back in a new way, uh, whatever that may be. Um, and then once I kind of start thinking about, oh, this is something that's coming back. This is these, this could, it could be presented in these different harmonic contexts, the different variations of this idea. I, I end up writing it down. And sometimes I try to just say to myself, just just write everything down. Um, but after I improvise, I, I uh, start creating a collection of different ideas and seeing how they can fit, again, with this the parameters of a certain piece, be, a, be that the, the instrumentation or a certain instrument has 
very you know, limitations in terms of its range or its timbre and how um, I can experiment with these different colors with the instruments. Um, and also, if it's going to be, if I want the first section of the piece to be like fast music, fast and exciting music, or if the the piece is a little bit more, you know, ethereal, or if it's if it's supposed to evoke some kind of sad or or troubling experience, whatever that may be, I create this collection and then I start constructing the piece pretty much measure by measure or um, idea by idea. And I do pretty much everything with pencil and paper um, when in that stage because I feel like the the when I go into Sibelius and I, I open up a score and I actually see the measures um, and the t- piece, you know, the title or, or any kind of thing, it just scares the living daylights out of me. It's so intimidating to look at a piece of blank paper, be that on Sibelius or, or be that in real life. Um, so do you, are you you're writing down on just like blank staff paper though at the at the piano? Yeah, but I have a I have kind of a, a big uh, sheet of paper because I feel like that with with staff lines you know, with with staffs on them or staves on them, but it's it kind of it's kind of freeing because when you have that big piece of paper in front of you, it, it feels like opportunities are endless which at the stage of, of starting a, a new piece can either be really exciting or really scary because it's, it's just so hard to, to start something. I mean, once right. you kind of get going, it's, it, things kind of start aligning or like I like to say like the stars begin to align in a way uh, for a certain piece or this idea connects to this idea or this section will prepare um, you know, this new... Uh, kind of mood or theme that I'm developing later on that I want to like that I'm really um, excited about. So, but but starting the piece is the hardest thing to do, and it's still to the like I have to start a piece like now, and I've I've kind of been procrastinating. Uh, but I think tomorrow is going to be the day. Tomorrow's the day. Tomorrow's the day. Um, well, and, and there's there's a, there's a huge truth to that. In that, I think there's like a saying like the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Right, and that first step is is almost for everyone. It's the hardest thing to do when you're creating something. But I never thought of that when you're looking at Sibelius or Finale, which uh, these are programs where you can write the music in. You can write on a staff the the notes and the, the rhythms and everything. If you have that, and it's like you know, you write an eighth note, and it shows okay, what's the next eighth note? It's like right. well, I don't know. <laughs> exactly. I don't know if I want it to be an eighth note. So that's interesting. You know, people are still writing things down on paper. So if you're writing something, do you then all of a sudden maybe get an idea and think, oh, this little thing I improvised two weeks ago, that could work here? Yeah, I think so. And even even ideas that I'm, I develop improvising, like that I develop through improvisation, I kind of keep in the back of my head or again, it's like these ideas I keep coming back to, but may not work for a, or for the, the particular piece that I'm working on at that moment. So I kind of keep things kind of in the back of my head. And when an opportunity arises to use that idea, um, then I just, I just go for it. And again, like things start to align and, and these ideas, since I'm improvising every day and uh, working with these things that are coming back, they themselves develop over time. I can start thinking about developing my ideas more in a piece um, than just doing like one idea here or the next idea here. I mean, I want to, my goal or one of my goals as a composer is to, is to, for each piece to have some kind of identity. And for me at this stage in, in my process, that identity really arises out of the material that I present, but what do I do with that material? It's kind of like telling a story, like where, if your if your ideas, if your musical ideas are characters in that story, like what kind of adventure, what kind of conflict, or uh, you know, where is that story going, or where are these characters going, and and trying to build with the audience, I want to try to build some kind of relationship to that material. <laughs> So we have a, I have a couple of clips of your music here, and I think a lot of what you're saying now is kind of like, uh, to me, really identifying with some of these examples, um, especially with the whole everything having kind of an identity. Here's a clip of your work, Images from Falling Water.
listening to this again after hearing you talk about your process, I feel like I can hear especially some of this improvisation, like especially rhythmically between the piano and then the percussion. Totally. And it's actually, it's kind of cool that you point that out because um, some, sometimes people will tell me about, tell me something about my music that I was like, oh, really? I didn't think about that, but that's really cool. But yeah, I, I think that that's kind of a section from the piece that's very lively. And, and that's the intention that I wanted for that particular section. Like that's the kind of mood that I wanted to have, this kind of crazed, um, crazed kind of context or texture that has things that come out of nowhere and almost trying to make the, uh, the listener feel a little bit uncomfortable. Here's another example. This is uh, something you wrote for String Orchestra, Constellations. That's very, very different in style and the whole feeling like a whole new kind of identity. Yeah, th- I mean, this is also a piece I wrote, uh, I believe, when I was a sophomore or junior in high school. And this piece really comes from my my geeky interest of uh, space and astronomy and space exploration. I attribute it to my mom, who uh, is works for NASA and um, is an engineer herself. And uh, we would as a family, go up to um, or down to the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia. And we would stargaze um, in the middle of the night because there's just not a lot of light. So you can really see these uh, beautiful just vistas of these different constellations. You can even see the Milky Way. And it's just really striking. Um, And something we do as a family, we just kind of point out uh, different constellations. We We even had the iPad app where you could like look up at the sky. With you hold it. it up to the sky and it shows you which, what you're looking at. Right. So total space nerds, you know. So um, for this piece, I, I really wanted to capture uh, that kind of, that memory of, of that with, with my family, but also kind of capturing the complexity of these different star shapes or these constellations and uh, trying to create somewhat of a, a parallel uh, between how stars come together to create these uh, compelling shapes and how different musical motifs or ideas, very simple ones, can can be presented in different contexts or you could say constellations themselves uh, in creating a texture, creating some kind of mood or, uh, or theme. I have one more piece of yours here. Now, you, you kind of said in the beginning a little bit you grew up singing in a choir. Was that yes. also with your family? It it actually was. Um, my brother was in the choir. My brother's five years older than me, so he was already uh, in the choir that that um, uh, that I also started in a few years later than him. And uh, both my parents actually met singing. They met singing in the Cathedral Choral Society here in D.C. And so singing has always been a part of my life and a part of our family. It's like a homecoming in a way. Here is part of a hymn for peace. So again, with knowing your process about improvising and everything, I mean, that sounds very different than constellations or images from falling water. That sounds more traditional in a sense, but very unimprovisational too. Sure. For choral music and vocal music, for me, it's it's all about the text. Uh, and it's something that I actually have come to realize more as I as I explore choral and vocal music myself, uh, just in my own studies. Um, but for but for these pieces, especially this one, it really just came down to the text and what it what it meant. I mean this is this is a sacred text. Um, but for 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 these types of pieces, I start 
just with uh, a certain poem or a certain text that I've chosen, and I, I write it out as much as possible, or I try to even memorize it. I'm a horrible memorizer, but, but for this, uh, I, I wrote down each line. I tried to really get acquainted with it as much as possible. And the music, I, I would really try to uh, sing myself or hum different melodies or, or try to, to create the best kind of prosody or, or how the, the music lines up with the text in terms of how a text would be naturally spoken. Um, but that's kind of a, a, a different kind of improvisation. It's kind of me humming things or, or singing things while... Uh, while at the piano and playing things out or playing harmonies as I'm singing this these these lines, um, it just really just always comes down to the text. That's fascinating in that it is a different improvisation. You're still improvising, but you're just singing or humming along. But it, the text being the I guess use the same word a sacred part of the composition. The text is is the focal point, and using the rhythm of that as a guide to then create the melody as opposed to here's this melody now how do i cram this uh this text <laughs> into this piece and I, i'll be i'll be frank with you when i was in middle school and i was writing my first like choral piece it was based off of um it came the start as a melody actually i was improvising the piano i was like ooh, this would be a great choral piece uh so i went uh online and tried to find a poem that kind of had the sentiments that I was thinking about, but um, that really had the main uh, criteria of, uh, of matching the, the melody that I came up with. Um, so I've kind of gone away from that a little bit. That's uh, good. But, uh, but I mean, paying attention or paying close attention to, to the text when it comes to music, it's, it's not, it's no groundbreaking thing. I mean, just take the the music of uh, Schubert and his leader and um, looking at the the kind of text painting uh, that he does with his uh, with his vocal works it's extraordinary um, and I've in a class in my theory class this semester at Juilliard we looked at a lot of his um, his leader and it's just the amount of uh, detail and intention uh, behind that adherence to the text is is so incredibly remarkable. It, it, what, it's what, make it, what makes his music him, I think. So we've talked about Mozart, Beethoven, all these composers and your process, but what is one thing that we, as in everyone, what can we do today to support composers? Uh, I'll just kind of make this very simple. Listen. Just listen to something new, something that... Uh, you've never heard of before that either you found online or um, on YouTube or if you're going to a concert that has a composer you've never heard of, listen. Just listen and, and go to these concerts. Um, I mean, experiencing something new, be that listening to a piece of music or picking up a new hobby or going vegan, I, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 it requires taking a risk. And that's just merely what listening to something new or listening to a piece of new music requires, just taking the risk, you know, diving into something new, uh, into the unknown. And you may, one may hate the, the thing that you're listening to, but there is even more potential um, that that listener may discover something about, you know, uh, something about a new sound or something about the world around us or maybe even something um, about yourself. I don't know. Um, but I think... Of course, we should listen to the greats, you know, Beethoven and Mozart and uh, everyone in the canon. But there is just this immense potential to have an even deeper connection to a piece written by a living composer uh, because it's just intrinsically the music. It, it's music that reflects who we are as a society and reflects who we are right here, right now. Um, so I, I, I kind of always think to myself like this relevancy um, of new music or of art uh, combined with uh, the transcendent power of music. I mean, just what an extraordinary way to experience art and to, to hear the world around us. Great. Well, thank you so much, Alistair, for talking with me about just everything composing. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the first episode of Classical Breakdown from Classical WETA. You can find out more about this episode and others at classicalbreakdown.org. 
You can also send us an email at classicalbreakdown at weta.org. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe in your podcast app. I'm John Banther, and I'll see you in the next episode of Classical Breakdown. Classical Breakdown.